Reading through the book of Jeremiah, we are in chapter 31. Of course, we're not going verse by verse and in not even uh, uh, chapter by chapter. We're hitting the highlights and uh, we got uh, this Sunday and next Sunday and then we'll be moving into something else. Uh, but in Jeremiah 31, I'm going to read these verses and then I'm going to give some explanations later and some things about these verses and then we'll look at some questions which I think will help then to clarify what we're talking about here. Remember now, Jeremiah has been sent to God's people to tell them that judgment was coming because they uh, had been disobedient, they're, they're uh, taken away uh, into exile and uh, uh, some of the leaders the prophets, the priests were telling them this is only uh, very temporary. We're going to be going back home soon. But God told uh, Jeremiah to tell them, no, it's not temporary. You're going to be here a long time, but you are going back home. But you might as well build houses. You might as well marry off your, your kids. You might as well do the things that need to be done. And, and the things that you do there... If you, are, if you help the people that are there, in the long run, it's going to help you. So he's telling them, do right, live your lives, because you're not going to be going back home right away. So he's talked to them about the judgment and all, and, and this lesson is uh, uh, giving some hope to them and some assurance to them that better things are going to be coming for them and their descendants down the line. So, picking up with Jeremiah 31, verse 23. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. When I restore their fortunes, they will once again speak this word in the land of Judah and in its cities. And this is it. May the Lord bless you, righteous settlement, holy mountain. Judah and all its cities will live in it together. Also farmers and those who move with the flocks. For I for I satisfy the thirsty person and feed all those who are weak. So he's beginning to tell them, eventually, there's going to be good things for you. At this I awoke and looked around. My sleep had been most pleasant to me. So Jeremiah, it appears, got this word from God in a dream. Look, the days are coming, he said. This is the Lord's declaration. When, when I was so the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of people and the seed of animals. I will bless you, he's saying, you and your, your uh, flocks. Just as I watched over them to uproot and to tear them down, to demolish and to destroy and to cause disaster, so will I watch over them to build and to plant them. This is the Lord's declaration. In those days, I will never again be said, uh, again be said. Remember, he talked about there, we talked a week or two ago about him uprooting, tearing down, demolishing, and destroying the disaster that was coming upon them. Now he says, that's going to change to the fact that I will build them up and plant them. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. We've talked about before things that happen when uh, uh, things pass down from generation to generation. And... And a lot of that happens when we teach our children the wrong things, live lives the wrong way in front of them, and they get used to those things. Uh, and I've told you, I, I, I talked to a man one time that was in his 50s, and he said he had just accepted Christ. And I told him, praise the Lord. And he said, well, the only problem I got now is I got three grown boys that I've lived a terrible life in front of, and now they live in a terrible life, and now it's hard for me to talk to them and try to tell them that I've been, I was doing wrong all my life, and they need to, to turn around. Verse 30, rather, each will die in his own iniquity. Anyone who eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. And that can go towards anything that you might think it is. It, could, it can go towards the lives that we live and the things that we do and uh, the iniquity that we fall into, the sin that we fall into, uh, and the bad things that come upon us then. <clears throat> Verse 31, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, northern and southern kingdoms, this is one 
This one will not be like the covenant I made with our ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I am their master, the Lord's de declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. Now, a lot of this is going to happen when he restores them. And the, the ultimate part of this is in, in heaven. No, the ultimate part is, is when we are with him and everything, everybody is right, everybody's good, and all the things is there. Verse 35, this is what the Lord says. The one who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves roar, the Lord of armies is his name. In other words, God created everything. If this fixed order departs from before me, this is the Lord's declaration. Only then will Israel's descendants cease to be a nation before me forever. This is what the Lord says, verse 37. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below explored will I reject all of Israel's descendants because of all they have done, this is the Lord's declaration. Uh, and the last verse, verse 38. Look, the days are coming the Lord's declaration, when the city from the tower of Hananel and the corner gate will be rebuilt for the Lord. Okay, uh, there's three, uh, three uh, main things here that he's talking about. Uh, in the first, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. This is constructive rather than destructive. It, he's talking about the time when they will, their descendants will return and the people will be uh, blessed and they will be blessed uh, with good crops and good, good animals and so forth. No longer would the Lord pluck up, break down, throw down, destroy and afflict, but rather he would build up and plant. So that's his, 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 his promise to them. One day this is going to come. Remember, though, and we'll look at it in just a moment, the ultimate time for this is, is when we become God's kingdom and we're with him in heaven forever. The second thing, behold, the days are coming. Then I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. God distinguishes this covenant. It was written on stone, remember. This one, he said, will be written on their hearts. And the other one was broken, and this one will not be broken. Ultimately, it was a, a covenant of grace that we, that we receive uh, today. We know that God forsaking them was impossible, and him forsaking us is impossible. And the third thing, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The tower, the, these, this, this tower and gate, along with two other proper names, refer to the northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest corners of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, so what are we saying here? Uh, at the bottom of the second page there, well, actually, uh, whatever page it is on yours, I don't know which one it is, where it says the new covenant has several aspects important to us. Uh, this is the blessings of salvation. This is the blessings that God brings to his people. Uh, Sometimes we go through difficult times, and we'll look at a little bit of that in just a moment. Uh, but ultimately, God brings good things for his people. And it may, you know, we have a lot of people that we see that, that trust the Lord, and, and sometimes their lives are, are, it seems like they are never in good situations, never in good things. But God promises that one day, and we have to keep our eyes focused on, on the future, and we have to have our eyes focused on the eternal, and we'll look at that in just a moment. The fulfillment of this covenant was to individuals, them, also to Israel as a nation, and also really to us today, because we are living in the church age, and that's the next thing I, I put there. And there's a remnant always 
in the election of grace. It will also be realized by the people of Israel in the last days, and that we find in Jeremiah 30 through 33. The ultimate fulfillment, we have to remember this, of the new covenant begins in the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ after the tribulation uh, and before uh, the white throne judgment where, where, where the, uh, those non-believers non will be judged and final judgment will come. So that is the ultimate fulfillment of all of this that we've talked about. Uh, any questions? I went through it quick. I know I said a lot, and hopefully some of it sunk in. Did it? Okay. The main thing we remember is this. Judgment may come, but for God's people, blessings are there. And, and that's what he's telling them. Before I was, I, I, we read a, a week or two ago where he was going to tear down, he was going to demolish, uh, destruction was coming. Now he's saying, I'm going to build you up. I'm going to be there for you. Uh, so we, uh, if we even, well, I, I got some verses that we'll look at that'll explain a lot of this. Okay, anything, any questions, comments, or anything? All right, we're still speaking about personal and national responsibilities and how we accept and follow God's direction for us. How do we know today which direction God would have us to follow? How do we know which direction to go? All right, we're led by the Holy Spirit, and how do we make sure we're being led by the Holy Spirit? Compare it to the Word. All right, compare it to the Word. We pray. Uh, we even sometimes we, and, and that's in the next part of this question, sometimes we go the wrong way, amen? Yeah. We go the wrong way, but then we stop and think and decide which way we need to go. We go through that process again. We rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance. Uh, we, we, we compare everything that we're doing to God's word and we listen to what he's saying. You know, praying is not just talking. It's listening also. And many times the Holy Spirit will speak to us while we are awaiting that. And we, we have to do that uh, and make sure that we are doing the things he would have for us to do. Describe how we keep focused on today and the concerns that, uh, uh, that, are, that are here, but at the same time continually put things in an eternal perspective. Let me read these verses. Uh, Therefore, we do not lose heart. In other words, a lot of things are going to come upon us, and we're going to have these situations where uh, things happen that we don't like, things happen that we don't choose, uh, but uh, they come anyhow. Regardless of how faithful we are, life is still life. Amen? And, and things happen. So he says... Therefore, even though these things come like that, don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. As we go through life, things happen to us. We are not the same as we were 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago. That's happening. And then he goes on to say, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Uh, so, uh, what is he saying there? Uh, always focus on the eternal. Uh, but we have to live in the present. But we have to take what is around us and always remember what's going to happen in the future. And even though difficulties may come, he says, that, therefore do not lose heart, but keep your focus on the eternal. Uh, anytime we get into difficulties, if we can't see a way out, it gets very discouraging. Amen? But if we can see a way out, even though it may be a year or two or three down the road, but we know there's a, a, an opening coming, then we can keep moving on. 
So to me, what he's saying in these verses here is this. Bad things may come upon you. And I've seen, I've seen bad, bad things come upon some very faithful people. But even in the midst of those difficult times, we've got to keep our focus on eternity. And we got to know the good that's going to be there for us. And these things that are happening to us uh, uh, are working for us more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. In the time that we go through the difficulties here, we should grow as children of God, grow into being more like Christ and a closer relationship to God. And that, that, the, the closer we have that relationship to God, the, the easier it's going to be for us to go through difficulties. I said easier, not easy, because it still may not be easy to go through some difficulties in life. But what, to me, what this is saying is, and I think this is exactly what he was telling them, you know, you're going to be going through some difficulties, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. At least you can know that blessings are going to be coming. So always focus on the eternal, but how the present times points to eternity. In other words, we're growing closer to the Lord. We're, we're, we're becoming more faithful to him. We are uh, doing the things that he would have for us to do. We're building a closer and closer personal relationship with God. And that helps us to go through the difficult times we're going through as we look towards eternity. Anything you want to say about that? When we go through tragedies, instead of focusing on that, that's an opportunity to, to grow closer to, to Christ. If, if you can, if you can uh, do that. Okay, Larry says when we go through tragedies, tragedies, it's an opportunity to grow closer to Christ. And I would say this. Uh, we, most of the time, when some type of tragedy comes, we either, as God's children, we either grow closer to him and depend on him even more, or we get mad and angry and blame him. We may not say we blame him, but, but we feel that way. And then we, we, we just become miserable. So we have a choice. We can, we can take these difficult times and use them as opportunities, or we can take these difficult times and get have our pity party and stay down the whole time. I seem to remember a story you told about a man that lost his wife, and because mm -hmm. he turned away from God, mm -hmm. but later he came back. Mm -hmm. I went and saw a man out in South Macon off of Jones Road. He was probably in his 60s, and I was probably 28, and they told me, to, uh, me and this other fellow to go and see him, and they said, he's a bitter, angry man. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I don't, know, I don't know if I know what to say or not. So I was talking to him, and he, he told me, he said, I used to believe in all that stuff. Well, I think he called it garbage. Uh, but I wised up. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit said, tell him what the Bible says about when you become wise. And I'm thinking, no, I'm not going to tell this man he's become a fool. I'm not going to do that. And uh, I said, you know what the Bible says about that? He said, yes, I do. I said, what? He said, when you think you become wise, you become a fool. And he started crying. And he told me he lost his wife about 20 years before that and was very active in church, but was angry with even God and angry with everyone else and that he needed to get his life straightened out. So uh, I was <laughs> almost terrified, you know. He, there he was, 30, 40 years older than me probably, and I'm thinking he's going to throw me out of his house. But, but he didn't take it as an opportunity. He took it as, a, on, as, as an opportunity to have him a pity party for all these years, and he turned the wrong way, and hopefully after that, he, he had his own church that he'd been going to, so he went back to it. So I, I guess that he, hopefully he stayed true to that <coughs> after that. But, but we have these, these difficult times can be opportunities to grow, 
or they can be opportunities. And, 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 and when we grow like that, it is a testimony to Christians and non-Christians of how we have our faith in God that we know difficulties are going to come. We, we're not free from difficulties just because we're children of God. And, and even so, many times we're the focus of difficulties because people are jealous and people want to do things to us and whatnot. So, all right. How has this new covenant, this covenant of grace, mercy, coming of Jesus Christ, how has it affected our lives? This new covenant of grace. How has it affected our lives? Gives us hope. Gives us hope. Why does it give us hope? We know where we're going. We know where we're going. We know about eternity. We know that we have an eternity with God. And we know that uh, in this life, we, we will have times when we falter. But in those times, because of his grace, we can still move forward. And, and, and I like to talk about two kinds of grace. The grace, saving grace that the Bible talks about in Ephesians 2. We're saved by the grace of God through our faith. Uh, but I think there's a sustaining grace that sustains us every day. Uh, and the Bible pretty much talks about it. I don't know if it says that exact word anywhere, but that's what it means. It, that God sustains us through the power of the Holy Spirit every day because of his grace and his mercy. And so uh, we would be in uh, miserable shape if we didn't have God's grace to save us and to sustain us. So it, 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 should, be, it should be very encouraging for us to know that God loves us so much that his grace is there for us all the time. We found that God's promises to Israel could, could be counted on. Uh, what promises from his word are most precious to you? What are some of the promises that God gives us in his word? He'll never, forsake us. never forsake us, never leave us, never forsake us. Always be there for us. Once we accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit resides within us, dwells within us forever, the Bible says. And then he walks alongside of us to help us every day. So that's a wonderful promise. What others? All right. You've been reading ahead in my notes? <laughs> okay. We're, we're going to go into that in a few minutes. We are. Uh, okay, so, so and, and in what Richard said, he does chasten us when we do wrong, but that is to build us up uh, and to, to write. And we'll look at, matter of fact, I'll read those verses right now. In Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Listen now. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of lights and live? <coughs> for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, God, for profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness or sanctification, us becoming uh, who he wants us to be. Now, this is a verse I really want you to hear in verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It's not, not fun. And it says here, but it's painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And we don't, we forget that last few words sometimes because God and our parents, our parents could chasten us, chasten us, chase, and we may not be trained by it, and we don't learn, and we still get that discipline over and over and over. 
And what these verses are saying is, God may come and chasten us for the, the, the wrongdoings of our lives. And if we are trained by it, then we have the peaceable fruits of righteousness in our lives because we live the way we should. But if we're not trained by it, he has to chasten us and chasten us and chasten us because we never learn to do right. You see what I'm saying? And there's been times, there's been uh, a lot of times in my life in years past when uh, God chastened me and I didn't learn and God chastened me and I didn't learn and God chastened me and I didn't learn and I wasn't trained by it until finally my hard head decided this is what I've got to do. And, I, and, and then I was trained by it. So we have to know that uh, just because God disciplines us doesn't mean that we're going to learn to do right. He wants us to. He guides us into that. He gives us his word to show us that. But we still may not listen. And, and you know, that happened. Yes, sir, Carl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're exactly right. And it can happen, so it can also happen to us, even as God's children, we can become somewhat hard-hearted towards him, towards whatever. Just like I was talking about the man that, uh, that uh, uh, Brother Larry re reminded us of, the man that I talked to, I believe he became hard-hearted, even though he knew what was right, he did not want to do right because he was angry. He was bitter. You know, his, 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 his life, his wife, the, who was his life, uh, was taken from him. And he wanted somebody to blame, you know? And, and so that happened. And that's why I say you can, uh, you can have tragic things to happen in your life. And it's, it's, it's either an opportunity for you to take that and grow from it and help other people that may be going through the same type of tragedies and be useful or you can have your pity party for years and years and years and never grow through it. That's what, that's what I tell Ray. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. You heard it. When we, when we do come through it, that's a good example for others. For others, mm -hmm. it is. And it's an opportunity for others to see uh, and none of us want bad things to happen, you know. But, now, you know, Jesus said in this life you will have tribulation. And tribulation to me uh, is that squeezing. You know, you see in the movies some of these things, some of these people that are, are uh, I don't forget what their names are, what the name of some of them are, but, but they're the hero, you know. And they're in this thing and it's squeezing in. And you say, well, there's no way they can get out. But somehow they manage to squeeze out, you know. And that, to me, is what persecution is. It squeezes in on us, and it squeezes in on us, and it squeezes in on us. And finally, if we're faithful, we gain from it, although that squeezing might, might, might hurt all the same. I mean, if you're going through some difficulties, never completely go away, you know? I mean, they just don't. And uh, until that time, and we pray you know, for loved ones, for uh, friends, uh, we pray for them for healing. And if they belong to God and they die, that healing came. It just didn't come the way we prayed for it. God healed them completely. And they now have a glorified body and don't have to worry about cancer, heart disease, lung disease problems or any other kind of kind of problems but sometimes we don't see it that way 
I'll never forget, and I've told y'all before, I went to see a lady that was, uh, I think she was 38 years old, I believe, 42 years old, something. she was real young. And somebody wanted me to go see her, and I had just started in ministry, and they wanted me to go see her, and they said she was dying with, with cancer. And I, I was thinking, <laughs> what kind of answers am I gonna give this lady, you know? And there I was thinking, I'm the one that's gonna be able to help this lady, you know? So I go in, and she couldn't hardly talk. Her breath, was, I mean, her voice was so so low. And I leaned down, and she said, I'm glad you came to see me. She said, God's angels have been uh, watching over me ever since I got this cancer, and they're here now, and they're going to take me to be with him pretty soon. And I went out of that room, and I said, you nut. You think you're going in there to help this lady out, and you're worried about what kind of, answers you're going to give her and she's already got all the answers she knows she's her faith is so strong she already knows and she's just waiting to go to be with the lord so you know uh we we can go this way or we can go this way and hopefully we will all use those as opportunities to be strong and i'm not i'm not saying you don't have difficult times we have difficult times you know and uh, I've had difficult times. I still have difficult times. We all do. But we, but we rely upon the Lord and his strength to take us through. And we continue to look, like we read a while ago, we continue to look to eternity and not on what's going on now. We, we use what's going on now to help us focus on, on eternity. All right. Uh, we better get off of that right now. <laughs> All right. Uh, describe how God can still love us, be faithful to us, continue to hold true to his promises, still give us direction, although we stray and deserve and get his discipline. That's what I just read for y'all in Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. He comes in like a heavenly father, a heavenly mother, I mean, a earthly father, a earthly mother, and disciplines us for our own good, chastens us for our own good, shows us what we need to do and not do, and uh, hopefully we learn from it uh, and we, we do right then instead of doing wrong. And I've had to go through both sides of it because I've gone through times when I, I knew what I needed to do, but I didn't do it. And he was, he was speaking to me through the Holy Spirit that I needed to do this, but I felt like I wanted to do that, and that's what I that's what I tried to do. Describe how we see, describe how we as God's people are already experiencing the effects of this new covenant. Uh, Jesus said uh, that He would give us abundant life in John ten ten. That abundant life to me is a life a life of peace, a life of hope, a life of forgiveness, a life of freedom uh, from the penalty of sin.